Hello, my name is Etienne Burde. I will make my presentation. So first I will uh, share my screen. Uh, so let's hope it's working. So now uh, I have shared my screen and let's take the presentation. And this is my presentation. So first, uh, human robotics, this is the activity of my group. So we use robotics as a tool to investigate human motor control, like the six fingers hand to see the limit of the brain. And we develop robot to help human, like uh, this person who cannot use uh, a, a normal wheelchair, so has, but can use our robotic wheelchair. Uh, I want to give credit to these people, so some of which, uh, so the work we will I will describe has been done with some of them. Um, so I grew up in Switzerland and I did studies there. Then I was for the postdoc in Canada, Japan, and, and USA. After I was five years uh, as assistant professor in Singapore, and I'm for 15 years in the UK now. And uh, so my main interest is human interface. So I want to use whatever technique is needed to understand human interface, human sensory motor interaction, and to make it work better. So uh, we do experiment, human motor control experiments. We do uh, modeling, so to understand what we find in the experiment and, and with a acquired knowledge, then we can develop application like uh, this uh, first brain control wheelchair <coughs> uh, 15 years ago. So we work on, on robot for rehabilitation after stroke, for example, etc. cetera. Um, I want to speak about two topics today. So this is the real title of my presentation. So interaction control in humans and for robot or in your robot. So I want to consider two tasks. So one task is uh, interaction with the environment. So when, you, for example, for carving, where you have to uh, skillfully interact with the environment that you don't know. The other one is for sensing. So when I have to go down the stairs, if I do not want to fall, I have to be careful uh, seeing where I have to go and maybe sensing where I should go with, uh, with the whale. And um, okay, so two questions here. So one question is how do human interact with the environment? And the dual question is how should robot interact with the environment to get the versatility and, and skill of humans. So that what we, so we with hope that by understanding how human uh, proceed, then we may be able to develop um, uh, very good strategies for, for robots. A summary of, of the first part of this uh, presentation. So this is about motor adaptation in human and for robots. So uh, we considered the interaction with the environment via a tool, and, and this is an unstable situation. We developed uh, a, a similar experiment where you have an unstable task and observe the behavior. From the behavior, we found that uh, people can control uh, impedance of the arm, and, and then we developed a model, a computational model, to understand better what that means. And, and this model later could be implemented on a robot so that if you have this stroke patient, so this stroke patient is interacting with human-like adaptation of the, of the rehabilitation robot. And if you look something interesting, so you have about 10 years from the pure uh, scientific investigation where you do not think about any application to the application, and I think you need that time uh, if you want to really understand something in science and, and develop something truly useful in technology. Okay, so let's go uh, more into the details. So you have interaction via tools, and, and this is an unstable situation. Another problem is that you have motor noise. Every time you do 
the same task in the same way. It's not exactly in the same way. You cannot do exactly in the same way. And then the question is, how do human do? Because this, uh, this instability is amplifying the noise. So how do human do to succeed in, in task with tool? So we design an experiment with a robot. So you do uh, wishing arm movements. So like uh, taking a cap and, and generally you make straight line movement and you have a force field that is uh, amplifying deviation to either side, to the right or to the left. And we see the experimental results. So in green, you have free movement. You see that they are never exactly the same. So free movement to the target. When you introduce this diversion force field, then the movement diverge. You cannot uh, converge to the target. That's a bit of a problem because you would like to, but you are not able to, to, to succeed the task. However, when you repeat the movement, uh, about 60 or 100 trial, then you become able to reach the target like in the free condition. And okay, so we know from uh, muscle mechanics, we know that when you increase muscle activation or when you increase the force that you, uh, with which uh, you, um, you press with a the muscle, then um, then what happens is that the muscle become more rigid. And, and so it's become stiffer. So what does it mean is that if you disturb, if you disturb, it's coming back with a, a stronger force. And, and that's a way to measure the rigidity. So you disturb a bit and you measure the reaction force. And, and what we thought is that because uh, muscle become more rigid, what we thought is that probably what happens is that when I have this deviation, then the brain is contracting all muscle of the same amount so that, so if I have the stiffness in the free movement, then I would expect a big circle around the stiffness to uh, stabilize the movement in the unstable uh, condition. However, what we found is something different in that you in fact increase stiffness only along the direction of instability, but not in the other direction. And we couldn't understand how the brain is so clever to do that because it means that the brain would be able to pick up the right muscle at the right moment. And, and we couldn't understand how the brain is so clever to do that. So we tried to uh, make a model to, to understand how the brain could do that. So a simple model, so you use very, very simple uh, muscle model just uh, considering the stiffness that is increasing with the force. And, and so you consider reflexes delayed and, and you, you build, you want to use the reflexes to build the feet forward. And we can, to guide the modeling, we can also look at the adaptation of, of muscle activity from one trial to the next. And when we record that, so we record the change of this muscle activity, so using surface electrode EMG, from one trial to the next, we see that when the uh, hand is deviating to the right, then the muscle will increase. But so this muscle that is a, a, a next tensor, so outside of the body, uh, is increasing more when you have a deviation to the left and the converse for this flexor that is a shoulder flexor. And so you have this kind of symmetric V-shaped function and let's try to understand how the controls, uh, the adaptive control is working. So again, we consider the change of motor command as a function of the error in previous trials, so trial after trial. And so this is this flexor extensor. And so when the error in, in, is on the right, we see that the flexor is increasing more than the extensor. So meaning that then uh, the flexor is stronger, then it will tend to go more to the left next time. And the converse, if you deviate to the left, then it will tend to go more to the right next time. And this is actually similar to something probably many of you know very well, this is iterative learning. That is just correcting for a bias of force. 
Now, what is nice is that it's not only iterative learning, you have also the muscle mechanics that, that come into, into question. And, and what is happening is that when I have, I deviate to the right or to the left, then the activity is increasing. And, and because the activity is increasing, the so rigidity is increasing, I get larger gain, so better control. And, and then I come to this area where I have a decrease of coactivation. So <clears throat> I have two principles, so a decrease of coactivation all the time, and also a selective contraction of muscle to, <coughs> to, to minimize uh, the deviation. And these two principles produce motor adaptation, as we can see. So you have on the top the simulation, on the bottom some data. So these are free movements that are well reproduced. If you have a force field to the left that is pushing the winds, and you see a gradual uh, adaptation, and you see the same in simulation, if you have this unstable force field, you see also that it's the, both the data and the model are able to acquire stability. <coughs> and the, the stiffness evolution is also um, predicted correctly. So this is in the, in the data. So this um, increase of st stiffness along the direction uh, of instability, and you have the same in the simulation. This is done with a, a very simple model. So you have two shoulder muscle, two elbow muscle, two double joint muscle, like the, the triceps, sorry, the, the triceps long head and the bicep. And, and you just uh, use again that uh, rigidity, so stiffness of the muscle is increasing with the force and this V-shape adaptation and that's what you get. Now, what is nice is that we can implement this on a robot. So you put this V-shape function at each joint. So this is compliant task. And, but when you press in a direction, when you disturb in a direction, it's becoming rigid only in that direction. Let's see that again. So this is compliant in all direction. And then when Ganesh is vibrating in one direction, then it's becoming stiff in that direction and keeping compliant in the other direction. And we can see uh, this as a task. So you have, uh, so you have this uh, periodical movement. And when Ganesh put the loads, and you have undershoot, and and you adapt, and you adapt, and you adapt, and you come well, and you come well, you come well, you come well, and and then you see that Ganesh is taking out the load, and then you have of course overshoot. And then again, you will have adaptation. Okay. And, and let's see what is happening. <coughs> so this is on the top, we see the change of position. So you see that you have converging to the target and then you have the loads and you have undershoot and it's converging again slowly, adaptation. And then you take out the load and you have overshoot, etc. And And this you would get with iterative learning again. But you have something more. So you have also stiffness adaptation. So when it is becoming better, uh, the stiffness is relaxing. But as soon as you have a, a big error, so a surprise, and stiffness is increasing again, and, and then when it's improving again, it is decreasing. And so then the stiffness is helping the adaptation because it is stiffening when the model is not uh, yet very good. And, and then it's helping getting good performance despite a, a non-perfect uh, force model. Okay, so we can put this uh, in equation. And, and uh, so recently, so Li Yanan did a, a nice analysis. Uh, he, so what you have is, so you have feed forward control, right? So the force is equal to a feed forward term. That depend on the on the plan movement and a feedback term. That depend on on the stiffness. And so you adapt the feed forward force to minimize the error. <coughs> Again, like like in uh, uh, iterative control, and you adapt also the stiffness to minimize the magnitude of error, basically. 
and and then you have also adaptation of trajectory and why you need that is so if you have if you have a, a soft tissue you do not know the shape of the object right if you have a, a, a pillow uh, like this then then you don't know you don't know the surface so you have to define the surface and you define the surface to the force so you want to apply some force and then you deform you press on the on the surface until you get this force and so <clears throat> you can adapt the trajectory in a way to to be close to that to that force and and these three adaptation of uh, feed forward force impedance and trajectory makes that you can adapt the interaction to a hard and and soft uh, material and so let's see uh, this uh, work that we did in an implementation at DLA in, in Germany. So first cutting of a steroform, what is quite hard, as you know, if you have tried. So you hear and you see that it's not cutting well if there is no adaptation. And when you put human-like adaptation, then you see that the cut is becoming much smoother and less noisy. And, and so you see the result, you see the result, you have much better uh, cuts with human-like adaptation. Um, we have, we can look at drilling also, so you have drilling and let's look at the result. Okay, so you see that with biomimetic adaptation, you get a, a much better hole, smaller hole than if you have fixed, um, fixed impedance. And, and okay, so let's look another adaptation, another implementation. <clears throat> so you have a surface, so what about doesn't know the surface? You have soft material on the surface. You have a force sensor, but the force sensor is not used for control. And, um, and, and so what about is scanning the surface? So you have an obstacle, et cetera. And again, so what about doesn't know the surface? And, and what do we see? We see that the robot has identified the shape of the, of the surface, but not only, it has also identified the stiffness. So the resistance to the movement as well as the resistance to identation. And it's doing that while keeping the force almost constant. So it's kind of, of uh, yeah, it's a kind of polishing task where you maintain a force and, and you go along the surface, but it's doing that without knowing the surface and on a soft material. And that's something that should open up many application for uh, handling on on uh, soft material, haptic exploration, etc. Okay, so uh, this is this is that for um, for this adaptation of impedance uh, for um, for action. Now this is adaptation of impedance to to interact with the environment now we want to look at another possible adaptation of co-contraction to uh, to to influence the sensing so again so if you have this step going down and you don't want to fall <clears throat> what can i do i can look now if it is dark maybe looking is not enough so i better Take the uh, take the 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 whale with my uh, right hand, and do I have to take it rigidly or, or or relax? And so, what will be better for the sensing? <clears throat> so uh, we have seen before that the the brain can adapt stiffness and and impedance to uh, to to 
to get a good interac mechanical interaction with the environment. Now the question is whether uh, this influences haptic perception. How does it influence haptic perception? And whether the brain can modify the body visceral SHCC to improve the visual haptic sensing. So the experiment we did to, to look at that, so you have the subject making with flex and extension movement, the subject is connected uh, with a spring to the trajectory and, and he can change the, the elasticity by co-contracting. So he can get better guidance by co-contracting. And, and you can have also, so you have a target and the target can be noisy, visual noise. So like this there, so if it is dark, then you do not see well. And we put different uh, visual noise condition. And, and so this is the experiment. So you see this experiment with this visual noise. <clears throat> And uh, these are the result of performance. So you see that the error is decreasing with practice, uh, with each trial. And at the end, so after a trial, you have about the same error independent on the visual noise. And what about the co-contraction? So we measure the co-contraction with EMG. And, and what we see is that the co-contraction is also decreasing. But at the end, you have larger co-contraction for larger visual noise. Now we have another experiment with haptic noise. So more uh, precisely, we have haptic bias. So you are connected to a trajectory, but this trajectory can be biased relatively to the visual target trajectory. And you have no visual noise. And uh, again, we have different uh, level of bias. So different bias, as you see here, in, in either direction and in, in different trial. And the result are, again, that uh, um, the error is decreasing with practice. But this time, you have more error with larger bias that is logical. So co-contraction is, uh, first, when you introduce a bias, is all the same level. It's higher uh, co-contraction after, in the trial, you have adaptation so that with uh, small bias, you have high co-contraction. And with large bias, you have very small co-contraction, right? So it's like here, the brain would like to use uh, haptic guidance to be more accurate. And, and here, uh, it's the brain want to filter the noise to not inject this bias into, into the system. Okay, so if we consider visual and haptic bias experiment together, what we see is that, uh, so we look at the co-contraction, we see that with higher visual noise, the co-contraction is increasing, but with larger bias, the co-contraction is decreasing, so just the opposite. How to, make, how to make sense of that, right? So what is a common principle? So we try the model uh, that we have used before for adaptation so that you want to minimize error and minimize contraction and, and the adaptation with a gradient descent is something like that. So this is a learning law. And when you simulate with that, you see that, so, for visual noise, you have the correct tendency. Uh, Co-contraction is increasing with visual noise, but not as much as it should. But for haptic noise, for haptic bias, it's completely wrong in the sense that the change is opposite to the data. So with uh, larger haptic bias, then uh, the uh, co-contraction is increasing instead of decreasing. So this uh, TEM uh, model is not correct. Now, because uh, we, we see that basically it seems that co-contraction is um, regulated in a way uh, to, to, to produce the required effect. So then we think that, okay, so we have different kind of noise and, and maybe the brain is considering the noise and combining these two 
sources of information, vision, and haptics in an optimal way and, and changing the coactivation to have the optimal uh, combination of these uh, two uh, sources of information. So we consider prediction errors, which is this one, with haptic deviation and visual deviation, and, and we try to minimize that. And what are the prediction from this uh, BEM model, so Bayesian error minimization model, we see that the trend is correct, right? We have increasing uh, coactivation uh, with increased visual noise and decreasing coactivation with increased haptic bias. However, the values we get are out of the physiological range, it's, it's diverging. So probably what is missing is that the brain has to minimize effort because we cannot uh, put too much effort, we have to minimize effort. So uh, this is this optimal information and effort model. So we try to minimize prediction error and uh, co-contraction. And we change, so we would change co-activation to minimize the prediction error and to minimize uh, the effort. And what are the predictions? So we see that the prediction are actually quite good. So uh, we get values very close to the data with increasing uh, co-activation with uh, visual noise and decreasing co-activation with uh, trajectory bias. Okay, perfect. Now, we use this model to try to predict what is happening when you have both visual and haptic noise. And, and so you have this blue surface that is a prediction. We want to test this prediction of the model uh, by making an experiment with combined uh, visual noise and haptic bias. And, and what is happening? So we see the 15 subject. We see that effectively, most of the subject increase a co-contraction with visual noise and decrease co-contraction with the, the bias, right? That's what happens. And uh, okay, so, um, and on, in addition, we see that the, the average value come very close to the, to the prediction from the model. Okay, so, <coughs> It seems that this uh, uh, optimal information and n uh, model is, is successful in, in predicting how subjects adapt to visual and haptic noise. So as a summary of the presentation, so um, we see that human identify and compensate for the environment force and impedance. And it's great because in this way, they can interact with hard and soft material and robot can do the same. And this is also interesting because it means that, so if you adapt to the environment, to the dynamic environment, like when you move in inside water or in the air, then the higher level of motion planning can neglect this dynamics interaction because you adapt and you can always use the same motion planning at the higher cognitive level. Now, so this is for motor adaptation to shape the mechanical interaction. We have seen that human can also adapt uh, the body impedance to improve perception. So that's something completely new. So not only we can use, uh, we can adapt body impedance to get a good mechanical interaction with the environment, but also to get as much information as is possible from the environment. And finally, uh, we propose this optimization uh, of prediction error and effort, or IE, so optimization of information and effort. And uh, this, this model is very successful because, because it can uh, predict both the adaptation of impedance to the mechanical interaction and the adaptation of impedance to improve uh, the visual haptic perception. And this is the uh, end of my uh, presentation. And if you have any question or comment on that, please contact me, for example, by email or, uh, or in the discussion of this workshop. Thank you very much.